All right, hello everyone. Uh, so I'm Damien George. Uh, I think maybe some of you know me from seeing me around uh, at some Python conferences before. Um, so, yeah, up here. So today um, there's going to be three of us talking, um, about 10 minutes each, and we're going to give you a bit of a taste of MicroPython, which is a, I'll explain what that is, it's a, a, a small version of Python. And I probably some of you have already heard of it and know about it, so hopefully there's some new things in this talk for, for everyone. Now, myself, so I'm actually, I'm an ex-physicist. I did a PhD in theoretical physics at the University of Melbourne uh, a while ago. Um, and in, you know, in sort of extra dimensions and string theory and that got a bit boring so I, I <laughs> found Python and, and that, that was a bit more interesting. No, well, phys physics is very interesting but um, so is computing and I, I love all these technical things. Um, but I got a bit distracted because I uh, rewrote Python add to run on microcontrollers which is what MicroPython is and I'll talk a little bit about that um, in my slides. Um, and after me Matt will talk um, about some hardware projects. So um, he's a software engineer uh, by day and uh, in his spare time he loves to work on all these uh, hardware projects. There's so many things here which are all his. Um, and I think there'll be a chance later on for you to come up and look at and touch things later um, after the talks. And then after Matt will be Nick Moore who's also a software engineer. I have a freelance software engineer here. I hope that's correct. <laughs> uh, and he loves to use MicroPython as well so he'll talk a bit about some projects. Um, so, uh, MicroPython is a complete rewrite of the Python 3 language. Um, so it's, it's not just Python 3 and taken and tweaked a little bit, but it's for a ground up uh, re-implementation in C of, of the language specification. That's what it tries to be. Um, and the idea was, in writing, in rewriting it, that it would be optimized so that it could run in really, really small systems. For example, um, it can run in 16 kilobytes of RAM, which is for the stack, the heap, the, um, and for, the, for all the data. So you don't need any more than that. Um, and 256 kilobytes of code space is quite a lot. So in that 256 kilobytes, you've got the entire Python system, plus a little file system, um, and you can do a lot of things just in that small amount of space. Yeah. So for example, on the micro bit on the right there, this, this device actually has 256K of flash and 16K of RAM, and you can run MicroPython and do some cool things on that. Um, there's no operating system. So on a normal computer, uh, you have Linux, Mac, or Windows, and then Python runs on top of that. But MicroPython doesn't have any operating system. It runs right on the actual hardware. So you can say it runs on the bare metal. So you really, Python kind of like is the operating system, or, or it is your interface to the machine. Um, so that gives you sort of a real feeling of that you're close to the hardware and you've got real command of it. You can set an IO pin high or low and, and do some really cool stuff. Um, so MicroPython, when I wrote it, I, there were lots of tricks and techniques I used to make sure that it could run in such a small space. Um, so a lot of the modules, like the sys module say in Python, when you do import sys, it has to load a file and and execute the sys module to bring it into memory. But in MicroPython, the sys module is all in constant data. So it's already loaded. You just have to sort of say, I want to have it. And then instantly it's there because there's no actual loading to do. So this really reduces memory usage. Um, tag pointers are quite technical, and but it allows you to store integers in an actual word without storing them on the heap. Um, and lots of tricks to try and reduce code size. Not optimized for speed, but optimized for space. Um, and that's the software side of things. From the hardware side of things, MicroPython can run on a lot of different uh, microcontroller boards, um, and you'll see some in action a bit later on. So yeah, it's been used in, in many things. Uh, Internet of Things is kind of a buzzword which is related to MicroPython because it, it's good for controlling Internet of Things devices and sensors. Um, but it's been used in teaching and research, university labs, uh, product development, rapid prototyping, um, and I'll talk about uh, a bit of use in, in space applications at the end. Um, so why did I uh, write MicroPython? Well, I, I really just because I wanted to have more fun building electronics things. Python's such a great language. Um, 
and you know on the desktop you use Python to write a web app because it's really fun you don't use C because it's really hard you don't want to parse JSON with C but you can parse JSON with Python really easily so the idea was that you can bring that concept to a microcontroller that you can parse JSON and make, H make HTTP requests and do things like list comprehension very easily um, and these days as you see here, there's so many electronic components that, you know, sensors and displays. Um, and using these things is really hard. You've got to read data sheets and you've got to understand them. And then you've got to wire all the things together. And then you've got to program in, say, C. And all these parts are complicated. And if anything goes wrong, it's sort of, you know, what, which bit went wrong? Was it the language? Was it the hardware? Was it because I didn't solder properly? So to try and make that process a bit easier, I thought, using a language like Python can help with the software side of things. So they were the two main reasons, to make fun building things um, and make it easier to build complicated electronic stuff. So uh, it was back in the end of the, uh, 2013 when I started MicroPython and I did a Kickstarter to kickstart the idea. Um, and it was very successful. So uh, almost 2,000 people backed the project and it got, got nearly uh, 100,000 pounds worth of, of support. So along with the software, there was also a microcontroller board that people would get as a reward for this Kickstarter. Um, and then about six months later, we made 3,000 little boards um, in a factory, and that's a picture of them being made. Um, <coughs> and then a year later, I did a bit of work. I started some work with the European Space Agency because they were interested in using MicroPython on satellites. Um, Worked with the BBC to make a little device for uh, year um, year seven and eight uh, students in the UK to learn programming, so they could learn Python, use Python. We did a second Kickstarter in 2016, um, and got a lot more people interested. Uh, and then, yeah, there's been lots of development work since then, and hopefully our new PyBob will be out in a few months. So, there's been a lot of activity. There's lots of things I haven't mentioned here. Um, MicroPython has been talked about at lots of Python conferences and Linux conferences and Internet of Things conferences. Um, and there's been a few other sort of products that have grown out of that, um, out of MicroPython. Uh, the OpenMV Cam, Wi-Fi, uh, PyCom company, and Adafruit CircuitPython. So you can look these up if you're interested. So I'll just briefly describe some differences and similarities between normal Python and MicroPython. So um, normal Python you use on your desktop um, and it implements the Python language um, and has a big standard library to help you do all these things. So MicroPython implements the same language, Python 3 or Python 3.4. Um, it's catching up to Python 3.5, 6 and 7 eventually. But um, the language is quite complete, but the standard library uh, for MicroPython, it's sort of a minimal standard library, but it's very extensible. So if you need components, you could write them and people have written them. Um, but it's the core language really that it implements. And the idea is that if you have a pure Python script that runs on your desktop with normal Python, it should also run under MicroPython without any changes. Um, so that, that's sort of the goal. There may be some subtle things that are different, like the use of the locals um, function, things that you very rarely use that might be a bit different, and they're different um, because MicroPython can't support everything um, and, and still stay true to its goal of being small. Um, yeah, it's, at the C level it's completely different, so none of your C code, if you wrote for Python, would work. Um, it doesn't use reference counting, which actually means that it doesn't need to have a global interpreter lock, so MicroPython can have multi-threading without a gil. Um, that's sort of you can play around with that. It does work, you just have to be careful not to access two objects at the same time and different threads. Um, but it's an interesting way to see how Python could be done without a gill. Um, so, so this is my last slide. Um, and I said before that we'd, I was working a little bit with the European Space Agency, so that's like the European version of NASA. Um, and they were interested in MicroPython because it could be used to help them write software for satellites. So the, the idea, well, space, as I've said here, space is the ultimate test for software, really, because something's running up in a satellite which is, you know, hours away in terms of light communications. 
Um, so you can't really go there and change stuff. And if something goes wrong, it takes hours for you to even know that went wrong and that for you to change it. Um, also, the, the stuff that the hardware that software runs on in space is actually quite minimal because they're using uh, technology, say, 10 years old because that's well proven um, and it's been qualified and many, many millions of dollars has gone into making sure that the hardware is safe for, for running in space. So you only have, you know, 100 megahertz CPU and a few, and maybe 10 megabytes of RAM. So in that, you have to run an entire satellite. You have to, you know, have the whole operating system of the satellite and control the boosters and everything and communications. And um, so what they wanted was to have a scripting language that could run within a satellite um, that was still minimal, but still useful. Um, and MicroPython was sort of one thing that popped up on the radar and um, so I've done, uh, I'm onto the fourth project with, with ESA now to integrate MicroPython into a satellite software. Um, and the idea here is that there's an operating system that runs on the satellite and within that operating system, you have a, a subsystem, which is a scripting language. Um, and it could be, you know, Java or, or Python in, in case of MicroPython. And it can be used to load different scripts on the fly, literally on the fly. So the satellite's flying <laughs> and you're like, okay, we need to debug the problem with the solar panels because they're not working properly. So you write a new script on the ground and then you send it up um, and then it will run on the satellite and, and send back some data and do some logging. So it's a, it's a way to easily configure the satellite while it's flying. Because if you're using C to do that, um, you've really got to turn the whole thing off upload the new firmware and then turn it back on again um, for it to start running that new code. But if you have a scripting language, it's very easy to just swap in and out some code while the rest of the system is still alive. So this, this was the main idea with this um, so-called onboard control procedures. So they're like scripts for a, for a satellite. So it's really exciting and a lot of work has been gone into make MicroPython very robust and deterministic and we did lots of coverage testing to make sure that it was um, suitable for putting on a satellite so and all of that work has gone back into the the open source version of MicroPython that everyone gets to use so it's been it's been really exciting to do this this kind of work um, and yeah this is sort of just one aspect of MicroPython um, that uh, that's there so yeah lots of interesting stuff thanks for listening to me and <laughs> I'll pass on to Matt um, who will show you some hardware demos <laughs> Here, right? That's pretty cool. um, today I was going to look at it from a different point of view what Damien's talking about and I thought I'd show off just a couple of very small, simple projects that I've been working on, um, but sort of exploit some of the, the stuff about MicroPython that's really useful and really compelling for me as a developer. Um, so one of them is going to be this UPTV or Micro PTV, which is just a little display to give us the, I, one of the, the times when my next two trains they're going to arrive near my house. So 12 minutes, 26 minutes to the next two trains, right? So that just updates by querying the internet and displaying on the, on the screen. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, the other one is underneath my house, I've got this long section. It's 10 meters long. It's a couple of meters wide. Um, it's really dark, and I'm storing a lot of garbage in there. I've got a lot of side projects and hobbies and scuba gear and rock climbing gear, all kind of stuff. Um, <laughs> But it's really dark, so I wanted to light it up, and uh, it occurred to me that you can get these really cheap lead strips uh, from AliExpress, and maybe that'd be a good way to light that area up. And so, um, of course, what starts as a little germ of an idea becomes this all singing, all dancing. It's going to be dimmable. It's going to. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a sec. Um, <laughs> so, uh, why MicroPython? Well, it's a background for me. Uh, I'm a software engineer with a bit over 15 years' experience, and I've played around with everything from like low-level assembly in C all the way up to sort of web development uh, and everything in between. Um, but for me personally, uh, developing in the embedded space was just getting really frustrating and it felt like it was sort of developing for a bygone era. You're using these old kind of proprietary compilers which usually had poor support. They usually didn't want to talk to you if you wanted to use C++ or anything modern like you know, D or Rust or anything like that. Um, so I'd sort of been moving away from that because it was just frustrating and arduous to use. Um, 
And I see MicroPython as a way to sort of solve some of those problems. Um, Python, of course, is all you would know. Uh, uh, it's very expressive and elegant. Uh, it's a great language to use. It's very readable. Uh, something you write today, you can read in, in weeks or months' time. Um, like Perl, which we talk about all the time. Um, and one key point that we, we, a lot of people, when you're starting with language, it tends to be overlooked is that uh, it, like interactive development on the embedded platform is just amazing. So we can show you this later, but uh, you can create like a, a serial connection to the device and run your Python interpreter on the device and connect to peripherals live. And so coming from a C background where that's usually a whole compile, deploy, try it, hope it works, it doesn't of course, compile, deploy, what the hell's going on? Um, being able to see all of the, the connections to the peripherals uh, live is just an amazing development environment. And so for me, it's a complete game changer. Um, the other thing is timing as well. Um, all of these devices, peripherals, microcontrollers, have just become cheap and super powerful. Um, most of these boards here you can get for seven or eight dollars. Um, they have literally megabytes of RAM and flash. This one's got 16 meg of RAM and 16 meg of flash. Um, and it's a microcontroller, 32-bit. It's a dual core, 240 megahertz, and it runs Python happily. Um, so I think the timing is kind of good to be able to um, exploit some high-level abstractions when developing in these kind of environments. Um, I should mention 3D printing's there. I've just got a little case here that a couple of my friends, Sean and uh, Ola, put together. But 3D printing has enabled uh, you know, case development. That was something that was really hard a little while ago. Um, so I think the timing's getting to the point where all of these things are coming together to make uh, embedded development kind of fun, interesting, and uh, accessible again. Um, so I really see it as kind of an enabler. MicroPython enables me to scratch the itch, have an idea, and develop it um, in a way that's, that's freeing and, and quite, um, yeah, fun to do. Right, so micro TV. So that's this guy. Um, it's in a case. It didn't occur to me until just before that you can't see any of the electronics in here. Uh, <laughs> it's actually one of these guys. Um, it's a little microcontroller. It has Wi-Fi Wi -Fi built in. Um, so what we're doing here is querying the PTV API. Um, if you aren't aware, PTV actually have a really rich API. They used to have a terrible one. Someone built a new and really good one over it, and then they actually did the right thing and took that API and, uh, and started using it. Um, so this is synchronizing to NTP. Um, it is making that query to the trains, and it's updating the display. And this is all in a handful of, uh, I, I should have counted them, but it's probably like 50 lines of code. It's, it's very short. Um, we can go through the code later. I think I'm a little short on time for now. Um, these displays are about $5 online. The board was about six dollars, um, and putting it together was actually fun. My nephew, who's five years old, is crazy about numbers, and whenever he sees this, he gets all excited because he loves trains as well. So, for him, this is like the perfect little side project. So, um, he, he'll look at that all day. Um, the LED strip controller. So, oh, we don't want to pick it up. Hopefully, oh, it works. All right, so this is going to light up underneath my house. Um, again, a small little microcontroller board using PWM to uh, change the brightness of the displays. Um, one of the nice things, I kind of glossed over it in, in the, uh, with the micro PTV, but uh, MicroPython also supports asynchronous commands, uh, asynchronous programming. So what's really nice here is that as, we're, as we've got that fading routine, you'll see it delays, it, it's lagging behind whatever setting I have. There's actually an asynchronous routine there which is looking for what the goal of the brightness should be and then just iterating toward it. Right? That kind of code's really easy to write in MicroPython and it's a real pain in C. You've got to have an event loop and you've got a lot of spaghetti code to make all that work. So uh, I found that really, uh, really interesting to, to work on. Um, again, each of these strips is about seven or eight dollars. The board's about seven or eight dollars and we've got a little bit of custom hardware here. Uh, thank you, Oliver, for doing that. <laughs> um, a couple of power transistors to get it through. So. I think I thought I'd quickly show you, since most people here have got some experience with, um, presumably with Jupyter. Uh, actually, just hands up, who has used Jupyter or knows of what Jupyter is? Okay, so real briefly then, um, it's a notebook style of development where you can run uh, blobs of code in, inside cells. Uh, if we have a look at this. 
excuse me for kneeling down. Dead air, huh? <coughs> cool. So this this is Jupiter. Um, there's a, a MicroPython kernel for Jupiter. So at the top here we've got this is the only command you need to make the serial connection to whatever port you've got connected. I don't know if port if COM4 is the right one here, but let's see if we can execute that. Come three, okay. Let's try come three. Right, three. Uh, and let's see if we can get I don't know if that'll work. Defined. Maybe I should really have tried this before. <laughs> anyway, I can show you this later. <laughs> but um, the idea would be you make a connection to your device and then you can execute commands on it just as if you were like live connection uh, via a serial com command. Um, that was what I wanted to say there. Um, although I really like MicroPython, there are a couple of caveats, most of which we have plans for addressing. Um, but right now, the documentation for some of the ports is not very full, so we still need some work to do there. We still need to do some work there. And some of the ports themselves uh, are really well supported, and others are not so well supported. So that's being uh, improved all of the time, like people are updating, um, updating each of the ports. Perhaps we should explain too that the MicroPython interpreter is, is very cross platform, but we still need people to uh, develop it for the various hardware that they're, uh, they're trying to target. So. Um, there's a whole bunch of microcontrollers that are very well supported, but you know, if someone releases another one tomorrow, we need to do some work to get it working on that, on that uh, platform. Um, BLE is still up and coming, uh, so we don't have a BLE implementation yet for, uh, for MicroPython, but it's coming pretty soon, I think. Don't you know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I mentioned here the standard library support. I can go into a few of the details um, perhaps afterwards with them. Um, Sorry, excuse me, what is your Bluetooth, so Bluetooth Low Energy. Yeah. So um, we've got Wi-Fi support, um, but not Bluetooth yet. Uh, that's kind of the, the big remaining feature, I guess, that we've got to get in there. Um, stand library support, so Damien mentioned before that the language is, language is super well tested. You kind of glossed over that, but Damien has an amazing job of making sure that the language itself is very well tested. It's very stable, it's rock solid. Um, but some of the standard library could do with a bit more uh, implementation, so we're still working on uh, some of that. I mentioned NTP before, um, which we've got great support for in a couple of the ports, but we don't have time zone support yet, so we're only, we're only able to synchronise to UTC, for example. Now, we can work around all of that, and all that development will come, but we're still, you know, we're still getting some of those kinds of things. Um, but apart from that, it's yeah, really exciting, really fun to work with. Um, that's really all I wanted to sort of say today, but uh, I encourage you all to come up here a little later and have a look at some of the hardware. Um, and oh, actually, one more thing to show. I've got a cable. So I've got a few more things I want to do with this. Obviously, it's pretty ugly at the moment. I've got to try and fix that. Um, I want to make it scroll and you know, fade in, scroll out, that kind of thing. Or I might use these uh, NeoPixels to display the time. So. Uh, these things can be, if you haven't seen NeoPixels before, they're like a little, yeah, thanks. They're like a little LED that can be, it's got RGB in it. Um, now it's super easy to arrange these in a seven segment display, which someone's gone and done for me, thank you. Um, actually, a call out to the uh, unexpected maker who did that. He's uh, going straight. Um, super bright, super cheap, um, and yeah, it's a really neat way of sort of showing off that, uh, that information in a different kind of way. And again, that's like a single line. Uh, like I built a small class, which was maybe you know, 20 lines um, to interface to these things. And again, we can do that live, which is really fun. So that was that. Um, that's about it. So I'll hand you to Nick. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. It's a treat to itself. All right. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nick Moore. Um, uh, as I said at the start, I'm a freelance software developer, which is kind of fun. I kind of stumbled upon MicroPython a, a few years back. Um, I'd been developing some stuff for the ESP8266, um, and it was quite a complex little idea of a, a, a little visual programming language, and it used like a virtual machine running on the device, and I wrote an implementation of that in C and compiled it for the ESP8266. 
and that was really cool. And then I went away for about six months to do some other stuff because freelancing life, etc. And I came back and I had absolutely no idea what any of my code did. And I went, oh yeah, C, I remember C now. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, so I, I rewrote the thing in Python and the original implementation took me ages to, to come up with this idea and to find a little virtual machine and all the operations it could do and all of that. And the Python implementation took me, oh, maybe an afternoon. Because it didn't use a virtual machine, it didn't use any of that stuff, it just evaled Python statements. Um, which is kind of embarrassingly awful, but actually very, very effective. And the suddenly switching to doing embedded development with a language where you have metaprogramming and reflection and all of that sort of stuff, it really, it's very different. At which point I got more involved in MicroPython, a little more involved in MicroPython, and I got to meet Damien, and I got somehow involved in the implementation for ESP32, which was really cool. And of course, MicroPython's written in C, so suddenly I was writing C for microcontrollers again. I'm not quite <laughs> sure how that happened. <laughs> um, so we had a conference coming up uh, last year, December last year, called BuzzConf, um, which is an outdoor kind of camping festival and conference and all sorts of stuff, and it was really good fun. And we were trying to come up with a good project that would be fun to do in that environment that we just couldn't do anywhere else. And Myself and Andrew Fisher and Andy Gelmy from a Community Connected Hackerspace in, out in Hawthorne were talking about ideas for all of this and talking to, to Ben and Rick who ran BuzzConf. Um, and we came up with the idea of making rockets. Um, we thought, well, we've got an outdoor space. We can fly things in the air. We can, you know, drones are cool, rockets are cool, etc., etc. We can have some rockets. Um, and by rocket, I just mean something that had fires propellant at one end and it goes the other way. That's kind of fun. Um, and you know, our resources were limited, so it's not one of those rockets. <laughs> it's a water bottle, a plastic two litre bottle. You fill it full of water mostly and then you fill the remainder with compressed air up to 100 psi or thereabouts. And then you let it go and it does what you think it would do. It flies up in the air. If you get the pressure high enough, they'll go 50 metres, the unmodified bottle. If you mess around a bit more, you can get them up to 100 metres. I believe the world record is 800 metres or something by some university in South Africa, which is fairly ludicrous and doesn't look very much like a plastic soda water bottle anymore at that point. But anyway, um, so we had this idea and we thought this will be really fun and the weather will be really hot and lovely and we'll all enjoy it and we'll be outside doing cool, fun things. All right, what's our excuse? I know, we need to do telemetry on these rockets. Because the sad thing about water rockets is you let them off and they spend like two seconds in the air, during which time you mostly just sort of squint up into the light, going, where's it gone, where's it gone? Because we thought if we do have decent telemetry on them, we can tell, are they going better or worse? What's, will more pressure help? How much water is the optimum amount of water to put in them? There's some really fun sort of science experiment stuff to do that. So we thought this would be great. Um, I wanted to talk about how we can do this. One of the things that's been a, a recent sort of revolution, as well as CPUs getting tiny, um, is this thing called MEMS, Microelectrical Mechanical Systems. When I was at uni in the um, early 90s, this was like one of those funny little sections at the end where they talk about in like the last week because it's a bit far off and cool science fiction stuff just think someday we will. And now it's in every phone and everything and it's what makes we controllers what they are. These are chips that use 3D lithography to make a tiny little machine out of a silicon die. And in this case, we have an accelerometer on board the rocket, which is basically a chip that someone has cut away enough parts of that as it accelerates, the chip bends under acceleration. And you can pick that up as a change in capacitance inside the chip. And you can ask the chip, how fast are we accelerating? There's also a gyrometer in there that tells it how fast it's spinning around. And if you take the same general idea and put like a little membrane in there, a little hole, you have a barometer. The air pressure flexes the chip and the chip tells you how much it's being flexed and so what the air pressure is. This was science fiction in around 93 or thereabouts and these days it's about five bucks from eBay. So that's pretty good. That's another piece of progress. Um, there's a picture of one. Um, I found this on a Russian website called Zeptobars, which is just such a cool site. 
they've basically taken a, one of these uh, accelerometers and boiled it in acid until it came, comes to bits. And you can actually see physically there's holes in the chip and little bridges across the holes and those little bridges flex under acceleration and so on. It's fascinating that this is something that, that can be done and it's even more fascinating to me that it can be done so damn cheaply. Uh, those dies are about three millimetres across. So very, very small structures, but very repeatable, very usable. The other thing that's made this project possible was really, really cheap microcontrollers. Um, we mentioned uh, how cheap they've gotten lately, and this is an example of an ESP32 from a um, Chinese company called Espressif. It fits somewhere between the Arduino that everybody's been using for a long time, the, the AT Megas, and something like an RPI, which is a little bit of a heavier, more power-hungry, complex kind of beast. Um, as you can see, it's significantly more powerful than the, the Arduino class chips, and it's powerful enough to run MicroPython, which is really very handy. Um, it's also small enough, that's a board, um, it's small enough to fit in our little rocket and it's small enough to run on a battery the size of a, well, smaller than a matchbox. And because that's also small, you can basically get away with just wrapping it up in bubble wrap and then stuffing it in the end of a bottle and <laughs> firing it in the air. Um, we lost a couple of them. We, we, we lost a couple of them in a euphemistic sense in that they didn't survive and then we lost one of them in a very literal sense when it just didn't come down. Um, it turned out to be up a tree. It was found a couple of days later. But when you get down to a total build cost for your, for your telemetry package of uh, $15, I think they worked out to each, you can afford to do that. You can afford to say, yeah, stick them in a rocket, fire them in the air. Some of them may not come back, but that's okay. Uh, ESP32, the chips I'm talking about, the really nice thing about them for our purposes is they speak Wi-Fi. Um, that meant we could have live telemetry from the rockets. As the rockets were in flight, they were constantly sending signals back down to, down to Earth. And that was really handy. Um, really nice sort of immediate thing. You didn't have to like retrieve the rocket, plug it in, download some things, etc., etc. It made the whole thing very immediate. Um, there's an example, there's a prototype of the thing which consists mostly of little bits of foam and sticky tape. That was like prototype number one, it did not survive. Um, I ended up discovering, oh, my, my things aren't quite fitting on the screen for some reason, but that's okay. So I ended up making a version of that by wedging that inside a tennis ball with the theory that, okay, well that'll give it some protection from impact. And I went down to the park and chucked it in the air and kept a wary eye out for dogs and so on and so forth. <laughs> it survived a few throws, but eventually I discovered that it would spin very much too fast for the accelerometer to really know which way was up, so that was no use. So I got a pizza box, literally a pizza box, out of the recycling bin, cut it into a set of fins and stuck it on there with lots of sticky tape and then tried throwing it. And greatly to my surprise, it actually worked. And we got some, rec we got some recordings from the thing and I could see that it, it, air pressure drops as you go up. It turns out those barometers really are accurate to around plus minus a metre, which is pretty impressive. Um, you can literally see the difference between here and here, repeatably. Um, so it was quite easy to pick up on the flight that goes up to maybe 50 metres. Um, that's another round of prototyping. You can see I went from a long board to a smaller squatter board in an attempt to fit the whole thing into a, a little round package so it would be less prone to damage. Um, actually, I think, though, there you go. That's the, the same thing from the end. You can see I've sort of layered the battery and some foam and the controller and the sensor all together to try and make it as close to a little sphere as possible. Um, and that's the final version of the telemetry computers. Um, just by happy chance it turned out that the pins that were lined up on the bottom corner there just happened to be usable for the right purposes if you happened to assign them to those things. So save us a lot of pieces of wire and so on. And there's a tiny battery taped on the back of that. So we made about 10 of them and we fired them up into the air and they ran MicroPython and they largely survived. So I'm going to quickly talk about what we did in MicroPython. <coughs> so, oh wow, weird fonts. Okay, never mind. Um, so there's two parts to this really. I was mostly involved in the MicroPython part. There's also a thing that was receiving these messages, graphing them, doing cool things and all of that. I wasn't really involved in that. 
so I, I won't talk too much about it. Um, but this is just an example of what code looks like on this real project that we actually did, just so that you get an idea. So, this is a piece of MicroPython. It's importing a, a library to tell it to talk, how to talk to the pins. It's setting up machine.itc as the bus used to communicate between the processor and the sensor. And some basic setup stuff. And that just tells it what pins to look for the device on and so on and so forth. That's what's required to basically get this communicating with this. The bottom line is particularly amusing to me because we were talking before about developing live and the difference between C programming and all that. That command at the bottom is the command on the data sheet that tells you tells this device to turn itself on. So start start noticing things are happening. If you forget that line, you get a lovely list of zero 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 out of the thing. It looks like it's working, but it's basically measuring zero all the time. One of the lovely things about the way I was developing this is I was literally typing this in at that REPL. So when I realised I was missing that, it wasn't a oh great recompile, reupload, etc. Just a matter of typing that in, and then suddenly numbers start coming out. That's very cool. And this is an example of how it actually reads a record. It just grabs some data from the device, unpacks it into some numbers, and just like in any other Python code you might write, you can use things like struct to unpack things from binary to, to Python numbers, and so on and so forth. Um, that's a little, little lump of code, a little couple of lines that basically just say, hey, connect up to the wireless LAN. Try and find me a thing on the conference network. If it's not connected yet, sleep a bit and see if it's connected down. And this code basically connected up to the MQTT server and said, OK, connect me up a connection. And then that little bit just says, OK, use that, read some acceleration from before, and then turn that into a little text message, and then send that out on the uh, MQTT server and then wait a tenth of a second and go back around again. Not exactly elegant code, but that's literally all there is to it. That was the code cut and pasted into different things. That was enough to get this, which is, I'm sure you'll see, an excellent graph. Um, I can't tell you what the hell that is, uh, but <laughs> the bit where it's flat at the start is a bit lying on the floor, and then the jagged bit's me picking it up, and then the bit about 12 seconds is me throwing it at someone. <laughs> and then, <laughs> So it eventually, you know, we got to this point where you can actually see maybe, just maybe, that's it free falling. Shaky start, but we're getting there. I also wrote a version of it that talks more directly, actually sends just raw Wi-Fi frames over the device, which gives us much faster update rate and so on and so forth, and that's fun to play with. Um, I'll skip over that a little bit. So here's some pictures of the rockets taking off. This is at BuzzConf. Um, when we came up with this idea, it was partly inspired by the idea that there would be bright blue skies and hot weather and it's up at Balan, which is quite hot when it's hot and all of that. Instead we had, I don't know if anyone remembers that storm back in December with all of the whole don't leave your house and <laughs> it's going to rain three feet and possibly amphibians. Um, it wasn't as bad as they said on the news, but it was fairly damp in places. Um, but in the brief pause in the rain, we all got our raincoats on and went outside and fired water in the air. Um, Andy demonstrating proper workplace safety procedures there by holding the thing, um, but he's not looking at it. <laughs> um, so that's one of the rockets going up. Uh, because of the conditions, etc., we ended up derating it to only about 100 psi or something, which is you know, push bike tire pressures and not fairly safe. Um, and they still went a good way in the air. Um, there's another, there's a close-up of the launch that I just happened to be taking a lot of photos and got it just as it separated from the launch tube um, and just in time to soak Andy. Um, but yeah, you can see the general idea. It's basically just a plastic bottle with another plastic bottle shoved over the top as a nose cone. And in between the, in the gap between those two is where this little thing lived. One of the things I find fascinating about those photos is that if you look closely, you can see it's, it's some quite complex things going on there. There's a, a stream of water, but there's also a shower of water, and there's also a kind of like puff of steam there, where that last little bit of compressed air has come out and blown the last of the water out like a mist instead of, a, instead of droplets. Um, 
it suggests to me there's some interesting behaviour there that would be a really good set of experiments to try and work out what the optimum pressures and fill volumes and all that is. And we actually did get some telemetry data. So that's live telemetry that we just recorded and graphed. Um, you can see the, the top, well, the green trace is altitude, and you can see that it, it starts at a, it's kind of meant to be relative to sea level, but it's actually relative to nothing in particular. It, it's Because it's an air pressure altitude, it varies a lot. But it's relatively reliable in the short term, and you can see that we got up from around sort of 75 metres up to around 125, which is, is a pretty good success. Um, the spikes are really interesting. The bottom trace is the accelerometer readings, by the way. So the spikes and the pressure are really interesting. It's not actually air pressure spikes at all. Remember when I was talking before about the fact that these MEMS chips are all the same idea, this physical carve away at a chip and leave some little bridges and all this? That means that a pressure sensor, which has got a little membrane that's measuring air pressure across, is also quite an effective accelerometer. When you take off at several Gs, it bends the air pressure meter enough that it gets a false reading. And you can see there that the air pressure appears to drop at the very start, drop higher altitude, so a big spike upwards, as it's accelerating. And then you can see as it's starting to tumble on the way back down, you can see it starts to get very wiggly. And when it hits the ground, well, some bad things happen to the air pressure meter. <laughs> But overall, it was a really fun experiment, and we, we really enjoyed doing that. Um, and we learned a lot of things, mostly about running out of the way of rockets. Um, we have some video footage on there, if I press the right button. So there's some video footage of the rockets taking off. Um, that filmed by John Spencer. We had a little camera sitting on the thing. You can't see it very well in this, but... Um, it was enormously fun. It was amazing how much fun everyone had just firing the things off and experimenting with things like the tail fin geometries and things like that. So I'd really love to do that again this summer and get some, some more launching done. Um, possibly in a slightly more scientific way <coughs> once we've debugged all the telemetry. Um, cool, that's the end of my talk about rockets, but I just wanted to put in a plug for PyCon, which is coming up fast, um, featuring this guy and this guy talking about MicroPython. Um, not me, for a change. Uh, it's in Sydney. Um, it's in like three weeks' time. There's an IoT specialist track on the Friday, which will be really cool. Um, people talking about MicroPython, people talking about CircuitPython and various other variants. Um, so that'll be really an exciting event. Um, and yeah, uh, we should put in a plug for the MicroPython meetup, which is going to be, I think you said 29th. This, yeah, so we've been this month. Once a month. Uh, out of the hackerspace in Hawthorne. Yeah. Uh, people are welcome to come along and have a play and uh, I'm sure you'll get started if you haven't used this stuff before. So. Cool. Um, if you just go look up MicroPython Meetup, Melbourne Micro